So our first speaker is uh, from Natalie uh, Pang. And Natalie is a senior research fellow at the IPS Social Lab at the Institute of Policy Studies at Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy uh, at the National University of Singapore. So please uh, join me to welcome Natalie. Thank you, Audrey. Um, uh, thank you, everyone. And I'm really excited to uh, oh, put this on. Usually, I have to shift the mic downwards. This is the first time I have to shift the mic upwards. Um, anyway, um, thank you for the invitation. Um, I'd like to, I guess, um, start off by talking about some of the previous work I've been doing. In 2005, I started um, my work looking at um, if I was building and studying the use of participatory tools by a community of uh, rural women in Victoria. So uh, Facebook and smartphones didn't exist back then. Um, and then when I came back in 2009 and 10, um, uh, started to see a lot of uh, actually um, hashtags, um, you know, uh, activism happened, um, a lot of collective action and social movements happened. Uh, a lot of, uh, I guess, interest has been on the role of social media in um, coordinating resources, uh, disseminating messages and also mobilizing people, including uh, volunteers and all that. But I'd like to start off with, uh, um, I've been uh, in fact studying um, quite a number of issues um, in, uh, and movements um, in Singapore and also other parts of uh, Asia. But I'd like to start off with um, a proposition. There are actually two contexts of uh, issue-driven kind of activism. And the first really uh, are activisms or forms of actions that are driven by a, a perceived a pervasive discrimination. Uh, now the literature has established this, um, and um, uh, women, for, for instance, uh, usually um, take action or, or they take steps to um, uh, do something about the discrimination that they experience, for instance. Um, African Americans, Black Lives Matter, for instance. Yeah, and women, we know the hashtag that's trending with these women right now, right? Um, time's up. Um, I mean, too. Uh, African Americans, Black Lives Matter. And immigrants as well. There has been a lot of activism and, and um, um, movements that uh, advocate for their rights. Um, LGBTQ, um, you know, we have a very um, I, I would say it is the most sustaining um, and the longest running uh, movement uh, over here in Singapore. Uh, and um, all this, um, I guess, issue-driven activism are, are commonly associated with um, uh, discrimination that these people, these targeted groups experience. And, um, and uh, some research has also sh um, kind of talked about how in response to the discrimination, their identification with their targeted group um, is kind of a way to mitigate the otherwise negative um, consequences that they feel, um, like the life satisfaction and so on. I will have to find a better word for this, but there are some issues that are non-discriminatory. And in the context of Singapore, perhaps um, more uh, are seen as less sensitive and allowed to exist. Uh, so uh, so um, one example, um, I've studied uh, quite a few of them. One example is uh, talking about plastics, um, talking about uh, saving the earth in World Environment Day. Um, in between 2011 to 2014 or so, I was involved in the study about uh, Bukit Brown. Uh, where I studied the engagement and civic engagement uh, in the, uh, I guess, the, the pursuit of saving Bukit Brown Cemetery. And um, there's actually quite a few um, groups that were set up um, in pursuit of this common cause. Uh, and uh, urban remapping, and this is not actually one specific movement, it's actually uh, quite loose. Uh, and there are various kind of activism happening around this area. Um, you know, uh, in 
the talking about the road across Bukit Brown, for instance, one example of urban remapping, which is kind of uh, a citizen-led reimagining of what can be done with our very scarce land in Singapore, uh, is, for instance, uh, uh, citizens actually using Google Maps to show how that part of the road is not so crowded at the peak hour. So trying to say that, you know, um, there's no need to build a road through uh, Bukit Brown to save our land. Um, and in more recent times, um, you know, and this is ongoing, talking about uh, Golden Mile Complex, People's Park Complex, and uh, what else can we do to these buildings other than, you know, removing them, um, and so on. And these issues, uh, I would argue, uh, are less discriminatory. Uh, people can participate in them. And, uh, but unlike issues that uh, are more discriminatory, activism in these issues are a bit more fluid and they may not always have a clear um, in, in or targeted group. So um, let me talk about uh, the role of activism here. Um, and you know, this is a well-established theory, it's known as the rejection identification model. What this basically means is that when group members um, uh, stigmatize or discriminate a group, view the discrimination as pervasive, there are usually negative physical and mental health consequences. Um, however, if they trigger or sort of uh, start to recognize themselves, align themselves with their, you know, in-group, you know, and this has to do with their social identities, right? For instance, um, you know, uh, I'll because Kavanaugh is in my, on my mind right now, I will talk about that. If a woman who has been uh, sexual, sexually harassed, you know, um, and uh, see the Kavanaugh hearing, and start to see the other women come up to, to talk about sexual harassment, they are aligning themselves, and the act of actually speaking out as well, it can mitigate the negative consequences and increase their well-being. So empirical studies have documented these um, findings uh, consistently uh, about <coughs> stigmatized group. Uh, for instance, women, um, I've talked about that, Latino Americans, and older adults. There are many other uh, examples. Right. Um, so what is the role of activism here? Um, the concept of social identity has not been explored much in studies about activism. Or, or engagement. So a lot of uh, studies uh, uh, potentially talk about social identity, but it, it is usually sort of a predictor of activism. But uh, I think activism itself is reflexive. You know, the act of doing something can augment, can reinforce your sense of who you are and your identification <coughs> with your um, groups. Right, um, I've talked about that. Yeah, and arguably ac activism, you know, uh, doing something that, uh, you know, is supporting the group or the cause that you believe in should also reinforce their social identification with in-groups. And arguably, digital citizenship and their sense of well-being should they be the most enhanced for those who are most active. I say this in the context of, uh, you know, groups um, that perceive the same kind of discrimination. And I, I would think that um, uh, these findings, right, this potential uh, hypothesis may play out quite differently for issues that are more uh, less discriminatory. Okay. So um, there are two measures of, um, that I'm interested in, uh, and I'll talk about them briefly in the context of how they relate to digital citizenship. So um, I think earlier in the panel, uh, the idea of online social capital was, uh, you know, um, discussed. Uh, I'm interested in that as well. Um, and I think it's true that, uh, you know, the concept of um, online social capital especially, uh, and th th that's quite a few. There is the individual level, uh, which talks about their weak ties and, and strong ties and bridging ties. But there is also that uh, community level. Do I perceive or do I derive satisfaction with uh, my community online, for instance? Right. Um, but, uh, you know, um, online social capital, you know, in the context of digital citizenship is also associated with self-esteem, efficacy and engagement, which means 
if I report a higher uh, satisfaction of online social capital, I'm also more likely to say to have um, um, a higher reported level of self-esteem and uh, engagement. Right, and I think this is really interesting when we think about what kind of uh, citizenship model uh, we have here. Um, and um, I mean, unlike, uh, I, I guess there are actually um, papers discussing models of the citizenship. So, um, so unlike the, the idea that, uh, you know, uh, if you are a responsible citizen, you should turn out to vote, right? Um, this, I guess, emergent idea of citizenship um, uh, uh, talks about participatory civics, which has to do really with the process of engaging in um, civic or political issues. And I think this is really where online social capital is uh, really interesting because rather than, you know, I guess participating in um, normative or, or traditional ways of uh, um, making a difference, the, the idea of using social networks to make a direct difference um, is, a, is what participatory civics is about. Okay. And uh, in my study, it is measured by four items. I feel that others care about me when I discuss the political or social issues online, a sense of belonging when interacting with others online, I'm satisfied with interactions about social or political issues, I belong to an online community for these issues. Okay. And the other, um, I guess, concept that I'm interested in, uh, again, it has to do with ideas about citizenship. right? Um, is uh, the extent to which people or information are believed and trusted online. Okay. And I think this is important because it has to do with whether or not we use information to inform ourselves about issues. And um, yeah, and as I said, it has implications for being an informed citizen. The idea that you can make rational decisions, uh, you can make uh, um, informed decisions, right? Um, and uh, um, if you have, uh, you know, I guess, a greater likelihood to trust in and believe things you read online, you're more likely to rely on these sources to inform yourselves, right? Um, so in my study, it's measured by three items. People are sincere online, online opinions are believable. People who write an opinion online are very knowledgeable. So um, in the interest of time, I would love to talk about other issues, but in the interest of time, I will talk about my work uh, you know, in the Pink Dot movement. Um, so just a bit of background for those who are not Singaporeans. Uh, uh, Pink Dot just celebrated uh, its 10th anniversary. Um, so it started in 2009 as an annual gathering in support of the LGBT community in Singapore. Uh, it is the longest running, so since 2009, there has been an annual rally every year. Um, it happens between May to July. In fact, I think it's, this is the only time it has this year that it happened in July. Um, and um, yeah, and then what is interesting about Pink Dot is that there are also counter campaigns. So many movements uh, have campaigns and then they have campaigns, right? But in Pink Dot's case, it is a campaign, and then there are counter campaigns, multiple ones. Okay, and it has also online triggered threats of violence against the LGBT community, okay, um, which were very public. So I will present, uh, um, not sure how much time I have, I, but I will run you through two studies um, in relation to two questions I have. Uh, and the first question has to do with social identities in Pink Dot. Um, what I really want to know, even though the issue here, you know, um, we know established work has told us um, LGBT communities, uh, people in this community feel stigmatized, right? And their activism are uh, usually triggered um, because of the stigmatization. But what I want to know in, is in the context of Singapore, are there emerging social identities that actually is not just about identifying with that um, discrimination? So um, what I did there is, um, yeah, between 2006, for the 2016 gathering, and also for the 2017 gathering, um, I collected uh, about 300 over posts, articles, and also comments uh, from mainstream media, alternative media, and also pinned on Facebook page. Um, did a content analysis over there. 
um, including myself, nine coders were involved in the content analysis. And, um, but broadly, yeah, I mean, this is kind of the rundown of my cookbook. I had two units of analysis, one at the post level and one at the content level. A lot of, um, in fact, uh, social media research looks at the post level um, kind of content analysis. But I wanted to also understand um, the interactions uh, between the post and the comments, but also between the commenters. So um, that's why I had two. Um, and then there were other descriptives, like the straightforward stuff, the dates of the post, um, photos and videos posted, and so on. Um, the kinds of online engagement at the post level and also at the comment level, the number of likes, share, uh, what kind of comments uh, uh, they had, and um, yeah, emotional reaction. This is something unique only to the Facebook uh, uh, contents coming from Facebook. Um, I also look at uh, protest framing um, at the post level. I'm not going to go into that today in the interest of time and the uh, values in action. Okay, and the second uh, st uh, study, again, it's uh, actually uh, related to PINDOC. Um, and this was a survey that was administered to within two weeks after the annual rally in 2017. Um, and I'm going to talk about the three main measures here, right? I've talked about online social capital and online deliverability, but um, I also had 20 items asking people what exactly did you do uh, associated with PINDOT uh, for this year. So um, let's talk about SADI1. I think this is actually interesting, uh, given that um, I had, okay, five minutes. All right, I will not talk about the interesting bit then. <laughs> okay. So, um, yeah. <laughs> All right. Um, I, uh, I think this is really, uh, this is the other interesting bit, okay? Um, I think uh, what was most pronounced in terms of identity here is actually the series of posts and, and actually uh, comments articulating rights. Uh, the right to be different, the right to be treated differently, and the right to be treated equally. Right, um, and uh, you know, amongst all my content, this actually takes up about more than fifty percent of the post. Um, and this is an example. I'm sorry, this image uh, appeared like that, but it's actually just the light up at the end of um, uh, the rally, um, yeah, in 2017. So this is actually an example of a post that will be kind of uh, tagged to this theme. Um, yeah. Uh, if you can't read it, it is actually talking about, um, you know, the rainbow brings many things to people. Uh, it is a symbol of hope. And if you read on, it is actually talking about, um, um, yeah, prevailing over hate, right? Um, and then uh, we had uh, another theme, which is about supporting minorities. And I wanted to share this picture here because to me, this is really interesting um, about minorities supporting minorities. And this picture is actually about uh, three um, uh, posted to uh, Ping.sg Facebook group. Um, and they describe it as these are silver volunteers, older adults in, that came out to volunteer for the rally. Right? Um, and then um, yeah, another interesting one about protecting established values and, and stability. Uh, and these are religious values, traditional family values. But it is not always trying to say that because I think uh, uh, I must protect religious or family values, I am against people. It is, if you look at a lot of the, some of the polls and discussion, especially at the comment level, it is also reinterpreting these values. Yeah. So, um, so, so let me give an example, right? Um, and and uh, this is really uh, something that, uh, you know, came out at the comment level, talking about uh, yeah, LGBT groups and, um, you know, children raised by same-sex couple grew up to be confused and angry, right? Um, some of the common comments that actually uh, come out to say I'm here to protect the idea of a family, right? But there are also actually many posts that talks about reinterpreting these values. Okay, and then the last one is about a counter democracy. Um, and this really, um, uh, the idea of the counter-democracy, I think, is also a model of citizenship. 
right? Uh, it is not just uh, you know about reflecting a distrust of institutions, but also um, growing distrust of laws and policies. Okay, okay. Um, in the interest of time, uh, I will just skip through this very quickly. But I think uh, I just want to highlight one thing. Uh, it is interesting that um, to me. That some values are clearly distinctive, but others are a bit more fluid. And distinctive as in uh, those values actually identify with a very clear uh, group, but others are not so clear. Um, and I think it's also notable be that between 2016 to 2017, my content analysis actually do show that there is a significant increase in 2017. Um, but what's also interesting is that People were not just, the increase wasn't just at the post level, the increase was actually also at the interaction level, uh, at the comment level. People were talking to each other, right, in 2017, sin significantly more than 2016. I think this is actually, in fact, uh, uh, a symbol that the movement is maturing. That it's no longer just about organizers mobilizing people, but people talking to each other, a community there. Yeah. But um, yeah, this is, uh, um, I guess, cross-sectional. I wouldn't call this longitudinal, but uh, it would be useful to see if these identities and yours. <laughs> Can I have five more minutes very quickly? Five more? Two more. OK. <laughs> OK, my second study is about uh, different levels of activism. And does it have different? kind of uh, outcomes, right? different kind of uh, differences in terms of online social capital and online believability. So if you remember, I asked um, participants uh, 20 questions about what they did. And the factor analysis is actually very interesting. Two clear factors uh, emerge. The first is what I call frontline activism. And the second is a supportive kind of activism. If you look at the items there, frontline really means I will donate money, I will um, help organize groups, I attend meetings, I will speak to people about um, the issue, I will um, sign a petition, right? Whereas supportive kind of activism um, are mostly online, right? Uh, like this sort of dislike uh, when it comes to YouTube, or rated online content they did not create, for the poster or retweeted content or commenting. Um, I just want to show the differences between the two the outcomes, right? For those who actually engage in frontline activism, you can see that um, the difference, um, uh, there are significant differences in terms of uh, both online social capital and online believability. This means that um, if they are high, you know, in terms of they are more active, you know, in frontline activism, they reported greater online social capital and are also more likely to trust um, and use online information, okay? But, you know, um, if for those who are engaged in supportive kind of activism, right, um, the, uh, I guess the, so the relationship with uh, online social capital is also significantly positive, which means that, again, you know, if you do more of this kind of uh, activism online, you are also more likely to have greater online social capital. And interestingly, uh, relationship with online believability is not uh, significant. My time is up. Um, I will leave it there <laughs> for questions. Thank you.